Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, but you knew that. Hey, it's a great day to be alive. Hope you're aware of that. I hope that despite these crazy circumstances, you are aware and conscious of the fact that having a great day is your choice. And it is within your control, and I hope you take that control and make it awesome. I've got a great interview to share with you today with a very interesting guy. James H. Lowry grew up black in Jim Crow era Chicago, and in 1968, he became the first African-American consultant at McKinsey & Company, and later the first black senior partner at the prestigious Boston Consulting Group. He's had an amazing career and did so focused on creating opportunities for minority workers and business owners And I look forward to sharing that conversation with you in about three minutes. Before we go to Jim, I want to tell you that today's show is brought to you by the Noom app, N-O-O-M, Noom. If you want an unobtrusive way to take back control of your eating habits during this nutty quarantine, and speaking of nuts, they're an excellent source of protein when eaten in moderation, I can't recommend the Noom app strongly enough. This is for real. I'm using it and I've lost eight pounds in 12 days. Listen to that again. I'm using it and I've lost eight pounds in 12 days. No kidding. To get your free two-week trial, click the link in the show notes or go to noom.com. That's N-O-O-M, noom.com slash crazy money. One word, noom.com slash crazy money. The link is in the show notes or you can type it into that search bar, whatever you call it on your browser. Okay, how are you? Week eight of quarantine, starting to feel alarmingly normal now. And I'm saying this, of course, not being a frontline worker. I'm saying this, of course, as someone who has not lost his job, not that I have one, but as someone who is, whose life hasn't been turned upside down by this thing. It has been changed, but it has not been uprooted. But it is starting to feel normal. Not good normal, but normal. Like after my kids eat breakfast, I pat them on the head and send them upstairs to quote unquote school. And it doesn't feel weird anymore, which is probably the weirdest part of all. And with only three weeks left until, quote unquote, summer vacation, the longest summer vacation ever, it's going to be an interesting one. I don't know. With only three weeks until, I don't, I don't know what I have to say about that other than, boy, one day at a time, one week at a time. Hope you're hanging in there. Hope your loved ones are safe and you all are being kind to one another. Okay, let's talk about Jim Lowry. As I've said Many, many times, the best thing about doing this podcast, besides the, well, the millions of dollars I'm earning doing it, obviously, uh, the best thing about doing this podcast, in all sincerity, is the amazing people that I get to meet. And James H. Lowry has lived an incredible life. Growing up in pre-civil rights Chicago, Jim Lowry experienced more than his share of prejudice and inequality in the world, but he decided that he would overcome through education and hard work. After attending Grinnell College and spending time in the Peace Corps, Jim became McKinsey and Company's first African-American consultant in 1968 and the first black senior partner at BCG, Boston Consulting Group, years after that, where Jim worked with mayors, the federal government, and leading corporations to implement groundbreaking and historic workforce and supplier diversity programs, the likes of which hadn't ever existed before. Thus, the groundbreaking and historic part. Lowry continues to serve as senior advisor to BCG while heading his own private consulting firm, James H. Lowry & Associates. His new memoir, Change Agent, chronicles Jim's amazing life. For as impressive as his professional resume is, the story he shares in this book about his youth, college years, and his work in the Peace Corps are just mind-blowing. He's not only smart, incredibly accomplished, pretty damn funny, and networked out the wazoo, he is just... He's just the coolest guy, and so I was really excited to get to talk to him. Special thanks to my friend and former colleague, Kay Madati, for the introduction to Jim. Kay, I am grateful to you for trusting me with your network. And now, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy this conversation with Jim Lowry. My brother and I went to this very progressive private school on the north side of Chicago. We lived on the south side, and then all of a sudden, we were thrust into this culture. But the main thing, Paul, what really affected my life and my goals where I said, I want to be like them. I want to have wealth. I want to have security. And one of the things that I saw coming from the South side of Chicago, being a straight A student in a public school, the confidence that these kids had in the classroom was just amazing because they knew they had been imbued with this feeling that they could be successful. They could be rich if they so desired. 
And I didn't have that confidence. My name is Paul Ollinger. I'm a stand-up comedian with a background in the corporate world. I hit the lottery when I worked at a small company called Facebook. I'm fascinated with money, why we're so obsessed with it, and how it makes us happy or not. Welcome to Crazy Money. Jim Lowry, welcome to Crazy Money. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Jim, you've recently published a memoir called Change Agent. How did you choose the title? I guess the people gave me the title. You know, <laughs> and I started looking. No, seriously, I was thinking about what should be the title of the book. And my daughter and other people said, well, you know, you've been a change agent all your life. The reason was creating wealth in the black community. And they said, well, you've been a change agent. And everywhere you've gone, you're affected change. And we just think it would be a good, catchy thing to get people's attention. And that's why we even changed the cover to show the young Jim Lowry. Now was an awful. <laughs> I did I put on the back pages the old Jim Lowry, but at least you know, it was, you know, you can't say change agent with this old guy in the back. So yeah, that's how we use the first photograph. Okay, so change agent. What kind of things did you change during your career? You know, Paul, it's a great question. I think I went at it everywhere I went, consciously or unconsciously. I just didn't want to be a passenger. I wanted to be somebody who would really leave a mark for the next generation. So when I went to my prep school, I could have just gotten, you know, five years of education, but I realized being one of the first blacks in this very exclusive prep school, I had to be a model and I had to be somebody that people would take pride in while I was there, but more importantly, would open doors for other people. So it wasn't just Jim Lowry at five years at Francis Parker, it was Jim Lowry, who was an athlete, student, body, leader, et cetera, et cetera, that I felt I had to do. The same thing with Grinnell College. Everywhere I went, I wanted to leave a mark. Let's go back. Tell me about the neighborhood you grew up in. I tried to you know, illustrate back in those days, we thought we were middle class. We weren't. We, at best, <laughs> we were lower middle class. You know? <laughs> right, yeah. We felt it coming up, you were middle class. We were, we were middle class. We were lower. But both my parents were postal workers. So back in the day, you know, Chicago is still very segregated. But back in the day, it was very, very segregated. So we really didn't venture out of our neighborhood. You know, it was a fairly sizable chunk of land, but everything was contained in Woodlawn. The movies, the shows, the markets, the haircut, everything was there. So it was like a little big town. So as we lived our day-to-day existence, it was really fun. It was not as challenging as one would think is obviously as challenging as living in Woodlawn right now. I, mean, I, I wouldn't even go to Woodlawn without an armored car. You know, it's, it's that mm-hmm. bad now. Mm-hmm. But back in those days, it wasn't bad. And the only fear we had was venturing out of Woodlawn and going into neighborhoods we felt we would not be well received and it might even be dangerous. This was the 40s that you grew up in Woodmont? Yeah, but, you know, when I grew up, I'm giving my age away and I'm sure all your viewers will say, no, he's not that old. Yeah, it was in the 40s. I was 39. So in fairness, it was late 40s that I really lived. I was young enough to see what was going on. So you say your neighborhood was a pleasant place, but Chicago wasn't integrated when you were a kid. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. And it was very segregated. And basically, Blacks were on the West Side and the South Side. And there was a small pocket of liberal, progressive environments near the University of Chicago. Mm. And so it is interesting, I could say it, most of the people who were integrated in the sense of having, you know, interracial marriages lived in Hyde Park. It was not something that one would fear and go into other areas because it was not well received back in those days. You know, one of the things that I found interesting in reading your book was you start each section with a historical context of what was going on. And one of the historical bullet points you mention is that the year your father was born, he grew up in Memphis, or he was from Memphis, yes. thir- 37 blacks were lynched in Tennessee that year. Yes. And so we were still very much in a reconstruction era in the South at that time. And things were still very tense when you were a kid, even in Chicago, which was a more integrated, well, not integrated, but a more progressive place than the deep South at the time. Yeah. Well, even in the years before, I want to be accurate, but about 15 or 20 years before, we had the worst race riot of almost any city was in Chicago, Mm. where people would die. And you had light-skinned Blacks getting guns to defend the South Side of Chicago. 
I mean, and it started from an incident on the beach of Lake Michigan. It just grew and became very scary. But one of the worst race riots was in Chicago. Yeah. So it, it was real. But I'm sure things, similar like things like that happen around the country. And tell me about your education growing up. How did that get you on the path toward a corporate career? Very, very clear. It had a profound impact on me. I went to a very progressive, and you can, you have to imagine, this was in the 50s, okay, early 50s. My brother and I went to this very progressive private school on the north side of Chicago. We lived on the south side, very near the University of Chicago. So we would take three bus trips, you know, three different vehicles to go to this private school. And it took us 45 minutes every day. And we would go up there, and then all of a sudden, we're thrust into this culture which you have very, very smart kids, many of them starting in kindergarten from the school. So they started in kindergarten all the way up through the 12th grade. So the education was superb. I mean, what they were exposed to in terms of culture, in terms of reading, books, et cetera, was not what we were exposed to going to a public school. We got a good education in public school, but nothing couldn't compare to the school. The other thing was not only the student body, but the parents. So many of the parents of our classmates were like the who's who of Chicago. Very rich, powerful people. And a disproportionate number at this particular school was Jewish. Because Jews at that time, they couldn't get into the other private school. They couldn't get into Latin. That was not for Jews. They maybe you have a, one or two token Jews and that was it. Right. Now the University of Chicago is slightly different. It was more liberal. So we were going to this very progressive school with these very powerful people families. And what helped us, we were both athletes. My brother was an athlete, so I followed him. So I I participated in three sports, uh, football, basketball, and baseball. So the combination that we were athletes, we were also on stage and musicals. We did all the things that, you know, they expect us to do. It was a great, great experience. But the main thing, Paul, what really affected my life and my goals were I said, I want to be like them. I want to have a big car. I want to have wealth. I want to have security. And one of the things that I saw coming from the South Side of Chicago, being a straight A student in a public school, the confidence that these kids had in the classroom was just amazing because they knew they had been imbued with this feeling that they could be successful. They could be rich if they so desired. And I didn't have that confidence. I had the goal. That was one of the goals I had my daughter. That if I ever became wealthy, I wanted to make sure she felt secure like those kids did when I was at, at Francis Parker. So for kids that grow up in that environment, there's this assumption that success is going to happen to them. Whereas Absolutely. kids from different neighborhoods sort of assume that eh, at best they're going to make it to government service or middle class work or whatever. You got it. Mm. And yeah. And even if you start thinking about incomes, back in those days, anybody who made $10,000, we thought that was a lot of money. Mm. We thought that was a lot of money. You know, my parents maybe making 6000 a piece, right? 5000 Neither one of my parents ever made $10,000. You said at the top that you felt that you needed to be a credit to your race, that all your athletic and yes. social accomplishment was partly motivated by wanting to be a credit to your race. Was that a lot of pressure to put on a young kid at the time? It was pressure. Yeah, it was a lot of pressure. I think, Paul, but to give it a a real, you you mentioned in the beginning of each chapter of my book, and I mentioned some of the people, and that's what they used to say about Joe Lewis. They would say, Joe Lewis, champion of the world, black champion of the world, a credit to his race. Mm. So once again, it was instilled in us. I mean, you can go back and get some of these old tapes, and they'll say that. Bo Jango Robinson, you know, who's dancing with Shirley Temple. He was a credit to his race. So we all had this thing. And even as I started growing up and being in my 20s, they would never address us as Jim Lowry. They would say, Jim Lowry, the first black this, Mm. or Jim Lowry, the first black that. It was something that's almost a part of your DNA that you know that you're carrying this mantle that is very important to do well at it and also, you know, be the model to bring other people behind you. I still, when I think about, okay, well, how would I describe this interview to somebody? What's the thing that would catch their eye or catch their ear more accurately would be to say, who's Jim Lowry? Well, Jim Lowry is this guy who's had a very successful career in business. He was the first black consultant at McKinsey. And people be like, wait a minute, what? 
how long ago was that? You know, like, so it's kind of this description where people can latch onto it and want to know more about it. Whereas back then it was sort of your, it was the shorthand to who you were. I mean, that's, so I I guess the context of looking back at it feels a little different than it must've felt during the time. Oh yeah. Well, that's why once again, I tried to have before every chapter nuggets about what was happening in America. Right. You know, the whole just race relations. Throughout my book, I started talking about race relations and what was happening in the South mm-hmm. and, and what was the impact of the civil rights movement, not only on blacks, but for Hispanics and for women eventually, but also society. That's why when I talk about Bobby Kennedy, he had a profound impact, impact because he saw race relations as being very critical. And even if you look and we'll go into where we are today, when you start thinking about the disproportionate number of blacks who are dying because of COVID-19. Now, if you talk to the average black person, you know, in any circle, they will say, this doesn't shock us. <laughs> it doesn't shock us. You know, I mean, why are people shocked by that? Right, the right. only fear we is that whites will say it's a black disease. It's not a right. black disease. <laughs> right. It's a black economic <laughs> disease, okay? I mean, but you're laughing. I mean, we had somebody, you know, confront somebody and say, because of you people, we got this disease. Right. No, you know, yeah. it's not because of that. But it's the economics that black people in the inner city have to work. Black people, you know, have to go into environments that is not safe. They have to take those jobs or they got to take buses, and et cetera, et cetera, all related to income, yeah. or, you know, economics. So, so you were motivated when you saw these, these affluent kids and their nice style of living. When did that turn into a plan for you? When did you say, okay, this is how I'm going to go execute on that plan? When I graduated from Francis Park. When I graduated, I say that in the book. I think mm-hmm. at the end of that chapter, I said, leaving that school, I said, I wanted to be rich. I wanted to be secure. And I want to have an impact on society. How did you define rich and secure at that point in life? That's a great question because I think everybody has to have their definition of what is rich or what is a fortune. You know, people in Silicon Valley probably know, you know, you know a little about Silicon Valley. So if you're not billions, you know, they talk, they're not rich. I mean, I'm not rich in Silicon Valley. <laughs> I'm rich in my suburb in Atlanta, but not in Silicon <laughs> Valley. I'm, people feel sorry for me in Silicon Valley. I know it's a double world. I've learned about that, but no, I wanted to have, you know, the way I defined it, is have enough money saved so my daughter would be secure for the rest of her life. Because I was still going back to Francis Parker. Mm -hmm. I still had that image of these very secure young students. Their parents, you knew they were leaving them enough money that they would be secure to do whatever they wanted to do. If they wanted to be, you know, artists, they wanted to be a violinist or, you know, whatever. And that's what I wanted to do. But I also was smart enough early on to realize by observing and doing research on the parents of many of my students, I saw that they were the people wielding power in the city of Chicago. They were wielding power. So I always connected wealth with power, you know, and to be at the table, you can be a civil rights leader, you can be an artist, you can be James Baldwin, but the people who really can affect change are the people who have wealth who can be at that party and be with the right organizations. So that's what I did. Even when I went to Grinnell, I had about four or five businesses at Grinnell College, all making money. I was an entrepreneur my freshman year at Grinnell College because I always said, I got to make money. Right. I was giving loans to professors at (laughs) Grinnell College. I did. They would come by and say, hey, Larry, can you give money to somebody else? Okay. Hey, little red book. (laughs) Professor <laughs> so-and-so wants $100. Right. They've got to pay me back. You know? But I did. I did that. Now, what happened, as, as you read the book, then I went overseas. Right. So when I went overseas to Africa, you had this kind of combination of Jim Lowry still aspiring to be rich, but yet and still having a greater appreciation for the have-nots, the poor people from Tanzania who didn't have that option. So I was sort of like a, Bobby Kennedy, like he always felt when he came back from Mississippi, he confronted each one of his kids and said, damn it, you're a privilege, but you got to help other people. Hey, everybody, this is a commercial for the Noom app, N-O-O-M. 
When I started Crazy Money, I promised myself I wouldn't promote any product that I don't believe in, and I still won't. But after under two weeks managing my diet with Noom, I've lost eight pounds and I'm a believer. Here's what happened. A few weeks ago, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution ran an article about Crazy Money, and it included a photo of me on the cover of the lifestyle section, which was really nice. Except that when I looked at me, I could see a guy who was 20 pounds over his ideal weight. I didn't look terrible. I just didn't look good. And I'm like, I want to be fit. That's what I want to be. I'm not trying to be an underwear model. I just want to be healthy. And I was already exercising every day, like vigorously. But as they say, you can't outrun a bad diet. My diet has been awful, especially during the quarantine. Like mid-morning, I'll just wander to the kitchen and shove a handful of chips into my face. And then at lunch, I'd eat relatively healthily. But then I'd finish my kids' chicken fingers and french fries because we're terrible parents. And then mid-afternoon, I'd eat uh, half a leftover quesadilla. And, you know, it went on like that. None of these offenses were a big deal on their own. But after eating unconsciously for a few months, those additional calories jacked my weight way up beyond the comfort zone. What Noom is, it's my digital accountability buddy, and there's actually a real human on the other side of that as well. I still eat frequently through the day, but because Noom is watching my back, I choose apples, bananas, or a small handful of almonds instead of last night's pizza, two beers, and a half a wheel of brie. Hey, like I said, it's really working, and I'm down eight pounds, and I'm only on day 12. So if you want to create a conscious relationship with your diet, Go to Noom.com slash crazy money. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash crazy money, one word, and get yourself a free two-week trial. Or click on the link below in the show notes. Just scroll down past my handsome face and you'll see the link. Noom.com. 12 days in, I feel better, and you will too. So you spent a lot of time in the Peace Corps and related organizations overseas for eight or nine years, was that, between college and... Yeah, well, I mean, if you add it all up, yeah, it was, uh, you know, then I went back with McKinsey, yeah. Were you thinking about really changing the world through business at that point, or are you just trying to be of service in whatever way you could be at that time? I think I was more of service at that time. I was conflicted. I always still wanted to do my thing. I had a vision in the back of my head, and I thought that I could maybe have a career in foreign service. I mean, I was so taken in by and motivated to help the have-nots, to help their people in the third world. I came back, and the Peace Corps allowed me to go to college. I went back from there, and then I went overseas, you know, with the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. So once again, but I was still in a good position because I was a 25-year-old service officer with a good salary in a three-bedroom place that was very enjoyable, and all the Peace Corps volunteers would come over to my house. So I kind of had the best of both worlds. I was making a good salary, I'm entertaining all these Peace Corps volunteers. They're drinking liquor that I furnished for. It was a great life. You know? Your I mean, stories I- are fantastic. Will you tell the story about a guy who wanted to listen to jazz records at your place in Tanzania? You mean the tall guy? The tall guy, yeah. yeah. It was Kareem. It was Kareem. It was Al Sender. Then it was Kareem later on. Al Sender. And we were at a cocktail party. You know, he was bored. He was on a State Department tour. They had just won the championship. He was in the twilight. I mean, he was just beginning to be a superstar. And Oscar Robinson was the superstar who was on the back end and Kareem was on the front end. Mm-hmm. But Kareem had no interest whatsoever to be at this doll state department. He said, oh, can I get out of here? You know, he just knew it. So he kind of saunders over me and he was seven feet tall. He said, hey, man, you got any jazz? Yeah, I got plenty of jazz. Who you got? So I got cold train. I got so You got that? Let's get out of here. So we exit this high-end you know, cocktail party. He squeezes into my little car and we go to my place and we listen to jazz all night. Me and his wife, Abiba and my wife, you know. You and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, that's pretty cool. And Peace Corps gave you tremendous relationships with people like Sergeant Shriver and even Bobby Kennedy. Yes, tremendous. I mean, they really inspired me. I mean, Sergeant Shriver, you know, he was kind of the face of the Peace Corps. I don't think we've ever had another face like Sergeant Shriver. It didn't hurt that he was an in-law of the Kennedy. Sure. But he cared. He was handsome. He traveled the world. He believed in it. He believed in the young people going around the world. Then he started doing things like the head of the domestic Peace Corps and, and back in those days, the poverty program. But the Peace Corps was his thing, and he really enjoyed it. So, And he was the one that helped me go to college, and he was the one that inspired me to go to Peru and be an associate director. When I met Bobby Kennedy over there, that changed my whole life. You spent three days showing Ethel and Bobby around Lima. And you know what? I can tell the world, 
we snuck off and saw El Corto Base fight in a bull ring. El Corto Base is one of the famous matadors. He was from Spain. He was crazy. Ethel fell in love with him. She thought that was the craziest guy she'd ever seen fighting this bull. And he was. He was a show off. And she said, we got to bring the bull fighting. And Senator Kennedy said, no, nah, we can't do that. <laughs> you got to have bull fighting in New York. Yeah. She said, can't do that. Bring it to Cape Cod. Yeah. That's exactly where bullfighting yeah. belongs. Right. That, that ain't going to happen. It was a great two or three days, you know. And interesting enough, somebody showed me just two days ago of a photograph of me and Bobby Kennedy and Ethel in Peru that's evidently shown throughout his museum oh, that I didn't even know existed. It was a fun three days. That's so cool. And so then he sent somebody to come back and recruit me to work in Bed Stock. So I worked at Bed for Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation. Your career really kicked off, started to hit the highs when you went to work for McKenzie, or so it seems. Absolutely. How did you get hooked up with those guys? Yeah. He came and visited me one day and he says, uh, you've ever thought of working about, his name is Charles Field. Have you ever thought about working for a consulting firm? I had heard about McKinsey. I think they had done a little work for us at the Bedford Service and Restoration Corporation. But I didn't really know how powerful an organization was or how powerful the industry of consulting was. I had no idea. For those who aren't familiar with it, can you explain the status that McKinsey brings to the table? Well, McKinsey, they're probably still the largest strategic consulting firm in the world. There are other firms that have more people but doing high-level consulting for CEOs and heads of state. McKinsey was the first and the biggest. And it's still, from what I understand, the most prestigious. Well, people at Boston Consulting would not. (laughs) My McKinsey interview lasted about four minutes coming out of business school. They looked at my grades and (laughs) they were like, maybe you should go into sales. How about that? Yeah. (laughs) So So could you imagine what it's like? I went through 10 interviews to be the first black. Was that on the table? Was it spoken of overtly or was it sort of this, we both know what this is in terms of you potentially being the first black consultant at McKinsey? Was it spoken of overtly or just sort of implied the whole time? No, the headhunter told me. But like I said in the book, I didn't know if I wanted to go to McKinsey. Right. (laughs) Because I I did it. I'm so stupid, naive. I didn't know anything. I said, okay, I'll interview I, you know, I'll interview with, I had a television show. I don't know where I was going to you know. Right. You know, and I look back on that interview and, and those interviews, I said, oh, well, about the fifth or sixth one, I wanted to go to McKenzie. Right. But I had let them know I really wanted to go. So I was playing very cool and I knew I was doing well in the interview process. So, so you go from being in the Peace Corps and you hosted a, a local television show in bed and now you're working on Park Avenue. You're working Park on Avenue. Park Avenue and wearing a suit, making a lot of money with an expense account. How does your life change at that point? It changed so much for the better, but it really was hard at times. It was hard inside McKinsey and it was hard outside of McKinsey. How so? Well, you remember this in the 60s. I started McKinsey in 1968. Mm-hmm. So what happened in 1968? Everything. Everything. Okay. King was, you know, assassinated in 1968. Bobby, you know, and then, then we had Malcolm X. And, you know, it was troubled times in America. You had Vietnam War was still festering. You had the young kids, hippies and stuff. And they were challenging the status quo. Then you had the parties. and we, we, People don't realize that historically, the Republican Party was controlled by Eastern prep school people who went to Harvard and Yale. So you had that transitioning happening within the Republican Party. So you had a lot of change that was going. Then you had within the Democratic Party, the control of the southern states over the northern states. So a lot of stuff was happening. A lot of very dramatic things were happening in America. So you had a lot of educated, educated black people, as well as people on the corners saying, how could you work for the man? Mm. You're working at Park Avenue. You left Bed-Stuy where you're helping the people. You're a community organizer. And you're not going to be on Park Avenue in a three-piece suit. Larry, you're a sellout. Mm. And so it was a lot of that going on. So it was very hard, you know, psychologically even though I was getting so much from my experience at McKinsey, it was still hard going back. So I still lived in Brooklyn. I still lived in Brooklyn. And I commuted, you know, until to Manhattan. So it was a kind of every day I was going back into two different worlds. 
those two different worlds are kind of what define you, you know, reading the book. Yes. And in a world where political and philosophical camps today are more polarized than ever, you're both this enthusiastic advocate of the free enterprise system, but also a stark realist about social divides that capitalism has not only fixed, but has sort of exacerbated over the past several years. Like, how does it feel to fit into both of those worlds? Well, on one hand, it probably gets back to Francis Parker, right? So you asked me, what was the motivation? And I said, all of a sudden, I'm reeling and dealing with Fortune 500 CEOs. I'm dealing with heads of state in Tanzania. And I said, I want to be here. I want to be a part of this. But I ain't naive. I can't be out there waving a flag, you know, being a socialist, throwing any bombs. Because you ain't going to be a part of this game when you do that. Right. So how can you keep what you believe in close to your heart? but still function effectively for the company that's paying you your salary. And so what I tried to do, and I guess throughout my life, is to add value to wherever I go for the company that's paying me my salary, and hopefully I can respect, and really still be a change agent. So that's what I tried to do. And I learned. So that's the other thing that was throughout my career at McKinsey, which was seven and a half years. I kept saying to myself, God, there's so much I'm learning here. There's so much, you know, that I can get from these very smart people in my class, like Lou Gershner and people like that. I mean, Lou Gershner was in my class at, at, at McKinsey, you know. So we started at the same time. And these smart guys, they're writing stuff for the Harvard Business Review. And I absorbed as much as I could. I looked at all their decks. I looked at how they analyzed things. And, you know, I did all that because I said, I'm just going to get the power. This is empowering me as an individual. It's empowering me as a potential entrepreneur. It's empowering me as a change agent. So I absorbed so much in McKinsey and I always be grateful for McKinsey giving me that experience. And so I thought I had to do that. And the longer I stayed, the more I could add value, hopefully become a partner. Then once again, I was at a higher level in my plateau. The higher level, I tell young people, the higher the level your plateau, the more power you got, mm-hmm. the more you can affect change. So as long as you had that goal, on where you wanted to go, you have to learn to flinch because there were times I had to turn the other cheek. What do you mean by that specifically? Oh, yeah. I mean, you knew that sometimes the evaluations were not there. You know, you might be doing something as well or better than, than the other guy who just happened to be white. Right. And they get a different evaluation and you can argue that case, you know, or I share this in the book when I was in Tanzania, you know, I saw that this one guy from England was just out and out racist. He's a racist in Tanzania. This is catastrophe. This guy can't last. So just being honest with the powers to be, I said, this guy's not good for McKinsey. Right. Get him out. But they didn't want to hear it because he had done his homework. He was he was more senior than I was. And they kept me until they finally the president said, get him out. So I was kind of vindicated on that. But I mean, you see all these things and you could quit, you know, and I said, the only way I could survive because I knew he'd he was gunning for me when I said that. And then they kind of threw this last chance. They said, well, you can go out there and be part of the training of the top officials, you know, but you're not going to be in DAR with your kid. You know, you're going to have to commute every week and go to this little town with had nothing. One hotel, you know, and you know, that was it. And a mosquito net. And I said, I could quit, but I got higher goals. Mm. I'm not going to go out. My wife was very supportive. My child, my lovely child, she'd meet me every time I get off that plane on that Friday night coming back with that big grin. And I'd be motivated to go back that Monday and be a star. And I had to do it. And I did that for four or five months just to be able to get the right evaluations and, right. and, do, and move on within the firm. And all this time, are you partially motivated by wanting to be a credit to your race in the business world? At that time... There was a change. It was not, I want to be a credit to Murray. Because I'm saying to myself, being the first black at McKinsey and doing well, I am a credit. Mm -hmm. But it was at that time I decided I want to be a leader of my race. Right. It was that that transition from just being a credit to a leader. And I had this vision based on one of the questions you asked earlier in terms of the free enterprise system. And I say this in the book, and you picked it up very quickly. You know, the capitalism is not 
pure and you know and you know and i know what? that there's it's not <laughs> disparity i mean it, it's getting worse the disparity between the rich and the poor so it ain't perfect it definitely ain't perfect tech is making it even more imperfect but it's still i lived in a socialist country it didn't work either i can give you book and verse on what the socialists were doing in tanzania to get money yeah okay so it wasn't working so my whole goal was to be a part of the leadership in a capitalistic free enterprise system, but more importantly, to try and bring more blacks to play a different role in this. And so maybe it's simplistic, maybe it was naive, but I said, look, once they gave blacks a chance to perform, you know, first in the boxing ring and then later in basketball and later in football and then later in this, that, and the other, we contributed to the institutions that we were serving in. And I felt that if I could be the leader and bring blacks together around capitalism and creating more strong capitalists, it would add to our society. And that's what that's when I changed to be the leader in minority business. You seem to be the perfect person at the perfect time to lead all these efforts in minority business enterprise development. Oh, why are you using past tense? <laughs> well, because, because it, you know, we're going back to a time in America. No, I'm just kidding. Paul. No, I found, again, the historical context of all this was really interesting. And I'd love for you to walk through, because I grew up in Atlanta and because I still live in Atlanta, having lived a whole lot of other places, you talk about working with some of the mayors, uh, some of the first African-American mayors in the country at the time, one of whom was Maynard Jackson here in Atlanta. What kind of work did you do for Mayor Daly in Chicago and Maynard Jackson in Atlanta? And, and Because these are the programs that where you really made your mark and became Jim Lowry. Well, let's start with Maynard, because Maynard is another one of those people in my life found impact on me. Truly profound. He was a giant. What was he like? I mean, you know Atlanta. Yeah. I was introduced to Maynard when he was running for the second time, and he was running for mayor by David Franklin. So you know the part of history with Shirley Franklin, and that was David was the husband. And I knew him from D.C. And he went back to Atlanta. And he said, Larry, he studied. He said, Larry, Larry you got to meet Maynard. And I was still at McKinsey. I was still at McKinsey. So I got to know Maynard. And Maynard asked me to do the study to set up his first office in his first administration. So we just hit it off immediately because he had never heard of McKinsey either. So <laughs> when I told him about, about McKinsey, well, you know, it was a global company. He said, no, Ken, you know, how many black people there? I said, he said, well, you know, who was the first black? I said, me. <laughs> you were the first black? He said, yeah, you the first. So then we bonded, you know, then made him off me a job to be in his cabinet. I said, oh, man, how much you going to pay me? And he told me, I said, no, nah, I'll stay in McKinsey. So, no, but, I mean, so I said, so he laughed, the cost of you know? living in Atlanta in the 70s. Come on now. <laughs> right. So then we became, you know, I got to know Mayor, and I designed his first office. And I said, you know, how do you want to be known? You want to be the mayor of the people? You want to be named of the people who builds things? Do you want to be the one who brings economic development? To, the Maynard, true man and fashion, said, I want to be all of them. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, but Maynard, it's going to have an impact on what kind of staff you have, how you use your money, et cetera. So he said, well, I really want to bring economic development to the people. I said, okay, let's focus on that. And so Maynard took some risk, but he was he was the first one to start talking about using city money to foster minority business development. And how did he do that? How did you help him do that? Well, you remember, I mean, it was very controversial because Maynard, when you start building the Hartsfield Airport before it became named after me. Right, they, right. they made a combination, right? It's they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he said, okay, a percentage of all this good dollar is going to go to minority. You know, and, and that's when Pascal's went out there. There had never been any black restaurants in, in the airport. Then you had all these fast food, McDonald's and all of that. They had to have a minority. As they, the franchisee. Franchisees. Right. So many of the franchisees, and I'm not really mentioning names, but who are very wealthy, who diversified their holdings and everything, became very wealthy, but more importantly, became the pillars of the community. Then he was training young people like Michael Romex mm. and Charlie Franklin worked under. Mm -hmm. So he had all these bright young people working for him. But it was the main thing that Maynard was really coming up with the first minority business firm. He didn't call it that, but that's what he was doing. Through his power and through his persuasiveness, he did that. And how did that sit with the white business community at the time? 
it didn't sit well. <laughs> it did, I mean, seriously, I was in Maynard's office when he called up the presidents of every bank in Atlanta and said, you don't have any blacks on your board. If you want to keep the city's money in your bank, I strongly suggest you put some black people on your board. In 24 hours, those four banks put four presidents of black universities on their board. That's fact. <laughs> it's fact. It's the power of the mayor's phone. Yeah, but now you know Atlanta. You could go back in those days, right? We're talking about in the 70s and all like that. When things were just changed, civil rights was changing everything. Sure. They didn't like that. They didn't like that. And Maynard, Maynard could not get a legal job after his administration. Mm. He had to come to Chicago to be a partner in a law firm. They didn't like it. Right. And he was slightly different. And so to answer your question, by the time I went back to Atlanta, it was under James Ace Lowry and Associates. And I designed the first minority business program for any urban area was for the city of Atlanta. But it was partly because of many of the people that I knew from Maynard's administration and many of the people that I knew in Andy's administration that we designed the first minority business program in the country. These are the cornerstone of your career, it seems to be. These programs that you rolled out, not just with municipalities, but in the private sector with the top Fortune 100 firms. It's the who's who, Burger King, AT&T, American Express, Pepsi, Frito, et cetera. What are you most proud of in the way you've changed business for those companies? I think if I had to be very simplistic, they stopped thinking of minorities just being micro businesses that couldn't serve them well. And so now we've had over these years demonstrated that people of all colors, you know, Asians, Latinos, who can come and provide quality services at competitive prices and be assets to their supply chain and can help them make money. So the mindset, I think that that's one part of it. To me, if I had to summarize, it's a mindset change. So we tried to change the mindsets of CEOs and CPOs and people in C-suites that minorities could be very effective assets in their corporation and add to the shareholders' value. The other thing, which is really part and parcel of that, is to change the mindsets of the minorities themselves. So if you thought you could only be a million-dollar company and have only one car, that's what you're going to have. But if you thought in terms of being a $100 million company or a billion-dollar company, if you even don't make a billion and you're only doing 700 million, you're better off. So we tried to change the mindset and we still try. I'm still doing it. Trying to change the mindset. Back to the duality of your sort of approach to the world being you're both a capitalist and a populist kind of at the same time. It seems like what you're trying to do is, is help people see more potential for themselves. Absolutely. What's the most effective means for a person who grows up disadvantaged African-American in the wrong neighborhood today, what do they need to know that they don't know right now? I think the first thing they ought to know right now, if you're talking about 2020, Mm -hmm. is how can I be a player in a new tech global economy? I'm telling you, it's so clear, Paul, that things are going to change, especially coming out of this. Okay. Technology and how people do business. You and I on this Zoom, you know, 15 years ago, we weren't even thinking about it. <laughs> five so, weeks, uh, five weeks ago, a lot fewer <laughs> people were thinking about Zoom, you know? Include myself. That's okay, right. I just learned how to turn the damn darn thing on. Right? <laughs> so I include myself. Right. I do this. But you like my background. I had That's cool. Is that part of Iarta? Is that? Yeah, that's part of Iarta. Like that's it. part of my background. It gives me feeling of, I like we're going to come out of this thing. Okay, there's sunshine. The sun's going to come up again. There you right. go. But, you know, I think that that's it. Now, we got to, and I don't believe we are just do at the lowest level. I think we got to start educating kids to be, you know, able to be a part of this and low and understand all it. But we have to have medium-sized businesses. But I would hope that we could create some of the big mega businesses in our communities you know, like they did in Silicon Valley. Many of those, you know, many of the people who are superstars in Silicon Valley, they were from wealthy families. They were just very brainy and they had the right angel investors and they had the right products. Mm-hmm. Why can't we do the same thing for minorities? Why can't we have our own Zuckerbergs? You know, why not? It's going to happen. I mean, the change is going to happen technologically. Why can't we be a player? 
you seem very committed to blacks entering corporate America through the front door. And I don't mean that relative to the side entrance. Yeah. I mean that relative to, Hey, focus on education, focus on, you know, getting training, focus on where you go to school, as opposed to hoping you're going to become uh, an athlete or an entertainer as a, I mean, as a means to wealth creation. I mean, yeah, I mean, you've seen the statistics and then you hear mothers saying the same thing, mothers and fathers. I mean, they only going to be so many LeBron. I mean, even, <laughs> yeah, there's I mean, one. There's exactly I mean, one. In fact, there's a one. And who, he might be the best or the second best. We can debate that forever. Right. But I'm from Chicago, so Michael's my man. There you go. But there you uh, go. no, I mean, it's only a finite number. And even there, let's be very candid, maybe that 10 or 20% top basketball players are going to be set for life. The other 80%, unless they invest mm -hmm. well, you know, with the right people, they're going to be bankrupt. So it's not even just athletes. So it's just entering into that field. There's such a finite number who historically have been very successful, you know, in terms of taking that opportunity and creating wealth for themselves and their families. And now I'm so proud of LeBron and others who are reinvesting in the community. Like even Michael's doing that now. And he did it in his early world. So I'm all for that. But I'm just saying most of the people, like somebody said, you know, said, no, we're, we're not going to be basketball players. We're just going to own the team. You know, and you know, and that really stayed out with me. I mean, so now we think about owning the teams. So that's where the real wealth, that's where the next food theory comes in. Because you know, we could all be, you know, owners of basketball team. You can make more money the next time because the next food theories comes in. So I'm just saying, athletics. I'm for it. I had more pride in the entertainers now, right? Because I think people like John Legend and JC, they are real entrepreneurs. But more importantly, they collaborate with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that once again, you saw in my book, I have no qualms about criticizing black people or criticizing Hispanics. If we're not doing the right thing, I got no problem with it. But they're working together to create wealth together. And I think that's very important. It's a, it's a real message. What's the best way to implant that message into a, a young black person today? I don't mean that capitalism is pure and perfect, rather that you want to instill the belief in the younger population that there is a place for me in business, that there is an opportunity for me to live an autonomous financial life if I make the right decisions and work hard. How do you, how do you communicate that in an effective way? You know, uh, once again, I know I'm on a podcast. It's going out over millions and all millions, that. tens of millions, 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 tens of millions. But the secret, you know, within our community is have another black person do it. So I was part of Johnson Products and we Johnson Products was the first product that went on the stock exchange, American Stock Exchange. So when George did that and they saw how much money he made. Guess what happened to the market? <laughs> Next week, there must have been 20 hair care products. I right, mean, so once right. we saw him do it, they said, okay, even down to guys, a couple of guys in, in Atlanta, we bought their company. But I'm just saying, the market just grew. So I think the best thing is when you see these models, we have to do a better job of really disseminating the success of these models and saying, guys, we can do it. We can do it. And you can be a part of it. And a lot of them, some, a lot of them didn't go to Harvard or they didn't go to Stanford. And they were just guys who were entrepreneurs like, like a lot of non-minorities who just happened to do it. And I think we have to do that. But I think it, the message, too, that I'm trying to do in my talks and my lectures is to say, okay, I, I'm not even going to tell the name of the guy. He's going to talk to me later on today because he wants to have a $10 million economic program in the Bronx. So he's coming to me and he's going to probably help me. He wants me to help him raise the money. Well, just think if we had a lot of people that we could ask to give that check to. And that's why it goes back to Francis Parker and studying the Jews from all my life. You know, Stephen Birmingham's book, you know. You know, when we start seeing it, you know, Jews fight like everybody else. They fight too. But when it's a cause that they believe in, they write checks. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, protecting themselves and I will say it just like that, protecting themselves in this society, which historically has sometimes hasn't been nice to Jews like they haven't been nice to black people. Mm. They can protect themselves by being cohesive, powerful, and wealthy. And I think that's in the best interest of black people. I'm reading the book 
by a guy named Rabbi Daniel Lappin right now, and I'm going to interview him in a few weeks. The name of his book is Thou Shall Prosper, and it's very interesting to read his philosophy and and heading, taking on the topic head on of you know what people say about Jewish people and what the truth is and and why the number one factor to their success is the embrace that business is good and that yeah. it, that it is that it is a worthy use of part of one's life anyways to conduct business and to conduct it honorably. And anybody who feels any shame about conducting business isn't going to be as passionate about living their life and pursuing excellence in their career as somebody who does have that belief. Absolutely. I mean, if you read our crowd, our crowd had a profound impact on me studying this whole, the, the very point you're talking about. And if you just look at what you just said, for whatever the reasons in the sixties, People put in in our heads when I was fighting this battle going back to the bed stuy and being on Park Avenue that it was wrong to make money. It was wrong to make money. And that's not true. I mean, it's not wrong. It's what you do with your money. You know, when Gates and Warren Buffett can say, let's do away with malaria, you know, let's put some <laughs> checks on the table. That's some global impact. Yeah. So, but we were told not to be capitalists. And that's the sad thing within the black community. They come to the people, and I'm not, obviously I'm not the richest black guy in the world, but they will come to us and say, write a check for this, write a check for that, write a check for that. How in the hell do you think we got the money? Because we're capitalists. Right. You know, how can, how, can, how can we write all these checks for you guys? Every politician wants us to write a check. Every nonprofit wants us to write a check. Well, if there were more of us who could write more checks and bigger checks, wouldn't you be better off? Absolutely. Everybody'd be better off. Everybody'd be better off. But I'm just saying the chickens are kind of coming home to roost with COVID-19. Yeah. And you saw what I was talking about this stuff in 1968 with Bobby Kennedy. We had from 1968 to 2020 to try and get this together. So it wouldn't be, we're not going to solve it all, but it'd be much better But because we didn't do that, there are a lot of people at the lower ends of our economic model that are in very bad shape. And the impact's going to not just be on the black people in the south side or west side of Chicago. It's going to affect people in Winneka, Shadyside, and all those places in Atlanta. You know, what's the big expensive place where, you know, Hyatt has one where all you rich? Leo got a place there, you know. Oh, it's Sea Island, you mean? Yeah, I knew a couple of those places. Down on the coast. Yeah, and then you got the high end restaurants are going up there. But you know, oh, and it's affect those people too. Well, this is one world. Not everybody's clearly affected by COVID the same way, but like this is proving that there's no boundaries between human beings. I mean, we're all susceptible to germs. And so where one community suffers, everybody's gonna pay the price to some degree. To some degree. Right. I don't and I don't mean equally. I don't mean no. equally. I found it very interesting. Have you paid a price in your career for speaking your true beliefs about the importance of wealth and wealth creation to minority communities? Yeah. <laughs> you, haven't, you, haven't seen, you haven't seen Jim Lowry's name on any big board, have you? Yeah. <laughs> they said, I don't, I don't know if I want Jim Lowry on this board. You know, Let me take the board of the guy who doesn't talk all this stuff, doesn't talk black, and doesn't talk about change. Yeah. You know, what we would call them very safe Negroes. Yeah. Hey, really? Yeah. This is stuff we say ourselves. So I'll share it with you, Paul. Safe Negroes. <laughs> right. I mean, so they're going to be on the board. They're going to say much. Right. They're not going to bring up any issues. They're not going to argue for any issues. Mm-hmm. And because they do that, they get asked to go on two or three other boards. Right. But you're not making changes. You're a silent kind of Their go, name. go along, get name. along guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm, every year I'm part of Kellogg's big corporate governance two day seminar. And they know me and I know them well. Many of my friends, I said, man, I'm going to be fighting to get more people, women and minorities on board. I just hope that once they get on the board, they are really assets and in- enhance shareholder value, but also they don't forget how to spell diversity. Right. They're not just showing up, getting a check. They're not showing up, get a check. Right. So your book covers so much and, you know, we could talk for a long time about all the things you've done, but I wrote down a few bullet points. McKinsey's first black consultant, BCG's first black senior partner. You played catch with Jackie Robinson. You went to college with Herbie Hancock. You interviewed Harry Belafonte in a show you co-hosted with Roxy Roker from the Jeffersons and who is also Lenny Kravitz's mom. You guided 
Bobby and Ethel Kennedy around Lima, Peru for a few days. You listen to jazz with Kareem in Tanzania. You worked with CEOs like Lou Gerstner, Ken Chenault, Leo Mullins, and you served on boards with Warren Buffett and Steve Jobs. What was the most interesting part for you? Well, the most interesting part for me is that I learned over years that they put on pants the same way I do. Mm -hmm. You know? And so if you have this feeling that they're so much smarter or so much more nimble or this, that, and the other, you'll be paralyzed and you won't be a change agent. Mm. You won't be yourself. You won't be genuine. And you can be genuine and realize that you're just as smart as they are. Somebody said to me once, Larry, he one of the smartest black men I've ever met. I said, why are you going to put black on me? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say handsome, but okay, smart. That's good. <laughs> but, uh, in my old days. No, serious. I mean, what the hell? So, I mean, so that was it. And once you do that, you can add value. So I'm sure Warren would say, I'm, Warren would say I'm the smartest. But Warren would respect me for my opinions and what I did and how I articulated my opinions. Sometimes I agree with him. Sometimes I didn't. But that was the biggest thing for me to accept that Jim Lowry could be at the same table, be genuine, articulate what you do, the way you do it, just the way they do it, with facts, with logic. And at the end of the day, they could either accept it or not accept it. Or I could accept what they're saying or not. So once you do that, it's a feeling that you can be Jim Lowry, try and do things for the reasons that you think are the best reasons but with the most powerful people in the world and still get up in the morning and look at America. What are you proudest of in your career? Being a good father. I mean, out of all the stuff I've done, traveling the world, being a divorced parent, never put all that before my daughter. How'd you do it with offices all over the country and all these people who are hiring Jim Lowry and associates and they want to talk to Jim, <laughs> you know, right. when they have a meeting, they want you to be in the room, right? How can you be present for your daughter and for those clients at the same time? Well, it was cute that I'll share this with you is that uh, the other day I was talking to my daughter and she said, well, dad, how you doing? I said, hey, you know, you know, growing up, I was a latchkey kid. So I've been by myself and in an apartment, you know, or extended period of time when my parents are working. And she didn't bat an eye. She said, so was I. <laughs> <laughs> she said, were you running around flying, you know, going doing this? I had to entertain myself. And that's it. Touche. Touche. But I think the key, and I would say this to any parent, be they, you know, in a single family or dual family, whatever time you have with your daughter, make it genuine or son. Know that you love them and they love you and they appreciate you and give them quality time. So my daughter and I have taken trips around the world every spring for almost 15, 20 years. So when we're on that trip, it's just the two of us. We talk every other day. So even if you're not there, the love has to come across the wire. The love has to come when you're on that train. And then like when she talked me out of bringing a date at Legend's wedding in Italy, she was very, you know, smooth. And she said, you know, Daddy, I know you, you got several choices you could take to this wedding, but it wouldn't be too much of it. I'd like to be your date. Duh. She was there, right? Right. Yeah, she was there. Yeah. And we had a great week. We added another week to it. So I think that that's the most important thing. And she knows what I've been through. She knows what I suffered. I mean, she doesn't want to be that. And I said, you ever run run, Jay? No, I don't want to do that. So she's her own person. And I respect what she wants to do. And she respects what I want to do. And she's very proud of me. That's great. That's great. That used to be the thing that it was, a, have you ever heard of the Renaissance? Yes. And so I took my daughter once to the Renaissance. So the two of us were there and everybody's got to participate. And they had her on this big panel. I mean, she was on a big panel. She's the youngest. She's on 22, 23, something like that. And then they, they asked her, there's a lot of people on this panel. And the guy who used to be the, the top medical guy at NBC was the MC. He asked her, he says, come here. We ask all these other people, who are the most famous and person they respected most as a hero? She didn't bat an eye. She said, my father. And she started putting down why. And a woman tapped me on the shoulder. She said, how can you not cry behind this? I said, I'm pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think, I mean, that's, that's all any of us could ask for is to be able to have yeah. kids that are proud of us at some point, yeah. you know? Yeah. Hey, we're about to wrap up here. Is there anything else you okay. wanted to address before we jump off? No, keep at it. And, uh, you know, the, like I said earlier, and I was joking with you, like I said in the last chapter of my book, I'm not going to quit. So I'm going to keep fighting. I really do feel honored that I've been able to do as many things as I had. I have looked back, tried to help people, but I'm working with the next generation. I have no disrespect for my generation. But, <laughs> hey, they've know. had their shot, man. That's it's. They, yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna say. I mean, you know, I love them. They did their role, but I think if we're gonna win this battle, it's got to be the, the next generation, generation after that, working together. And I wrote an article for Savoy Magazine called "Intergenerational Mentorship," and I think that there are things that they can teach me about the world they're living and vice versa. But the key thing is, is open up communication and accept what you know and what you don't know. Jim, if our listeners want to find out more about you, is there a place they can go online to learn more about you and your career? Sure. I, you know, I got a website, you know, it's under James Lowry and associates. Is that J H L A.com? Yeah. And the name of the book is change agent by James H Lowry. It was a really good read. I learned a ton and your stories are just amazing. <laughs> You've had a really interesting life and I appreciate you sharing it with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. I enjoyed talking to you, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to read more about Jim and his book, Change Agent, scroll to the bottom of the show notes in the podcast app on which you are listening to this show and click the link for the crazy money store on Bookshop. Bookshop Bookshop.org is a consortium of independent bookstores that have come together in one great online platform and you can support them and crazy money by shopping our authors that we have interviewed here, including Mr. James Lowry. Thanks again, Jim. Also, folks, if you're interested in uh, getting your eating back on track during this quarantine, don't forget the Noom app is available at noom.com, N-O-O-M.com slash crazy money. Click there, get yourself back on track just like I did. Eight pounds, 12 days next week. Who knows what it'll be? Hope you guys have a great week. Mike Carano, make me sound smart.